Thank you very much for uh, all the presentations. And uh, we have uh, some time for the questions and answers, so I encourage uh, the, all the speakers to come forward and please sit on the stage as we did yesterday. And the first speaker was uh, Ben Keebler. And any questions from the floor to his presentation? Yes, please. Any microphone? Yes. yes, over there. Thank you. Thank you all for your nice presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about, um, I've been a little bit confused about testing for the scapular position in during rest and dynamic testing. Um, uh, I, I do it every day, so uh, I use it a lot. But still, I'm a little bit confused because I was reading this review from Struif in the Scandinavian Journal of Science and Medicine and Sport. And then they, 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 they show conflicting, conflicting evidence for bet uh, between healthy and injured shoulders. And on the, on the, uh, on the other hand, uh, your studies from, uh, and other, also from Strive, they, they say okay, when you exercise the muscles around the, the, the scapula, it's very useful uh, and the, the patients get better earlier and, 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 and yeah, they get m much better when, they, when you incorporate the, those, um, those exercises. So my question is, um, yeah, should we just maybe not look at the scapula too much and, but do the exercises? I don't know, but maybe uh, I'm wondering what's your opinion Do you do that, that in any other thing you look at? Yeah, I got a sore knee. Um, I'm not going to worry about that right there. I'll just treat it. Yeah. No, you don't do that. No, no I okay, the, what you have to do now, the, there, there's, your point is, is well taken. And it's a good point in that we've gone from knowing nothing about the scapula to knowing enough to ask questions but not have the answers. Now, that either means you stop, don't do anything about it, or you keep on looking for the answers. Okay? And so my proposal is if you see something and you don't understand it, you go a little bit farther rather than stopping. Okay? And, for example, in this situation, um, the, <clears throat> the, all of the questions that have been um, um, asked are very good questions because they don't, we don't have the answers, but they don't. They <coughs> uh, do not get at the reason why we're talking about the scapula, because every because if you look at this, you know that the scapula has something to do with the reason the patient can't do something, and therefore, what we do, whether it's because we put the scapula in a position, whether we exercise muscles around it as just part of this whole kinetic chain. Uh, we may very well, as Ann showed, you work on the scapula, you get your rotator cuff better, okay? You, if you get your hip stronger, your scapula stays in better position, okay? So there's this, and then you saw her chart, there's lots of reasons why that's not occur, why it's not working well. And you know, only some of them have to do with muscle strength. Some of them have to do with muscle, inhib a lot of them are inhibition of muscle activation. So that means you got to do that. Some of them have to do with internal derangements of the shoulder that's not going to get better until you fix the internal derangements. I mean, so there's a lot of reasons that this is going on. I think in terms of a discipline of understanding the shoulder joint, you cannot ignore it. Now, do we know all the answers? No. But you cannot ignore it because it's, it's half of the problem. And the reason why that comes up is because everybody's oriented toward the rotator cuff and the humerus as opposed to anything else. And that's a change in thought process, a change in how we look at it. I wish I had all the answers. I don't. But I can guarantee you that, that if, you, if you do these things and you, find that, and you incorporate however we do this, whether it's with these exercises. We were coming up with new exercises all the time to try to get these things to hold better. Then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get more and more uh, work. And I'm going to show you a couple this afternoon that uh, y'all have never seen before because we just came up with them. <laughs> and they tend to make the scapula in a better position. So the discipline of, of looking at the scapula, understanding, and because the scapula, there's not one normal scapula position. It depends on the activity, the individual, all, all those other things. So, so there's not just one pattern that's going to say is the best and everything else is bad. And, and so you see these variabilities, and this speaks to our lack of ability to fully picture the scapula, 
whether it's the motion monitors, whether it's the pins, whether it's you know, visual, whatever we don't have, it's not sensitive enough. So we're going to have to do better on you know, knowing about the scapula. And then we, how do we get this best position? It, a lot of this is patterning. A lot of this is plain muscle patterning. And, we don't, and until we understand more about that, then we're not going to get it right. You cannot work isolatedly on those muscles. Uh, I love Ann and everything like that, but I think putting the patient in prone positions is not, not the way to, to do all the exercises. You got to get them standing up. And so there's variability in what that goes on. We have this debate every time she and I see each other <laughs> about the, the position. But, but I think there's, there's a lot we don't know. And raising those questions, perfectly valid. Saying, well, that means we don't do anything about it, it's not valid. Any other questions? Yes. Looking at the neck and T-spine, uh, how much do you take that into consideration when looking at whether dyskinesia or any kind of shoulder pathology? And two, how do you explain asymptomatic patients that have dyskinesis? Uh, the first question is, I'm going to okay. defer to Ann, but, uh, but neck, neck and, and spine very definitely have a role. Scoliosis, you got all these tight muscles here. A lot of, the, however, a lot of this neck pain is from the tight levator and tight upper trap, which have to do with how the low trap works. So, uh, um, I'm pretty sure that there's a what I call a low trap deficiency syndrome, and that these patients present with low trap weakness or inhibition or lack of that alteration in the right way. And there must be a regulatory effect of the la of the low trap on the lat, pec minor, and upper trap because you notice they're always hyperactive. So there's, so you get this position right here, and you say, oh, that's neck pain. Well, it's not neck pain, it's, it's upper trap, spat, all these headaches and everything. The worst case scenario of any of these patients is this group of what we call scapular muscle detachment, which is a group of fairly rare problems. Uh, I, however, because of my interest, I've got over 200 of them in a cohort. And this is the worst case scenario because the muscles are not attached. And you, you talk about bad scapulas and whatnot. Those are bad. And they all, and about 25% of them have really bad headaches. You get scapula, you get the low trap reattached, and their headaches go away. So very definitely there's something going on in that way right there. How do I explain um, this dyskinetic pattern in asymptomatics? Same thing as a sulcus sign. Same thing, it's an impairment. It's an impairment of optimum function. And there's ways of working around that. Or you don't ever put your arm out through here. You don't do you know, There's a lot of things that, that can not create symptoms. And, and when the, while I think the scapula is central, it's not, a, it's not the only thing that's going on. So, yeah, you can have all kinds of things. And it depends on after exercise, before exercise, whatever. There's a lot of things that can affect that, too. Do you want to comment on the neck or anything? Yeah, regarding neck and thoracic spine, of course, it's important. But if, if there is, in your title, scapular rehab, you only talk about that and not about the rest. But in clinical practice, it's important. We do know that um, thoracic spine position influences strength, for instance, in the shoulder. So that's one. The second thing we do know is if you improve thoracic spine position, you sometimes have less symptoms. It's exactly the same as the scapular testing. is symptom improvement test. There is a very interesting uh, paper on that by Jeremy Lewis from the UK, who really works by improving the symptoms, and thoracic spine is just one part of it. And we also have some evidence that uh, thoracic spine manipulation improves symptoms in the shoulder. So there is a link indeed. The only thing is that real evidence always comes behind scientific, uh, the clinical experience. So now, for instance, in my department, um, I work on the shoulder, I have a colleague working on the neck, and we finally find each other in the scapula, and so she wants to know whether the shortness of the pec minor can influence neck pain and the other way around. So we are working on that definitely. But it's an important step forwards to look at that, uh, s although we do it in clinical practice all the time. If you have a patient sitting like that with a forward head posture, I always say, of course you have shoulder pain. Just start by sitting up straight. Okay, shall we go to the second presentation by Anne? Oh, Philip? Uh, this is for, for, uh, for Anne and, and, and Ben. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, I have a question for Anne and Ben. How often, first, first question, how often do you do a, 
Have you done or do you, do you ask for a long thoracic nerve release? And second question for Anne. Uh, how often do you uh, send your patient to a surgeon and for what? Uh, are you talking about uh, evaluation of the long thoracic nerve by EMG on these patients? Or are you talking about actually exploration and release? Uh, uh, exploration, I do it. Uh, we find lesions, but we, we rarely do surgery. Do you sometimes do surgery on these patients? Uh, no. If, if you Google scapula, the two names you're going to come up with are my name and a surgeon, neurosurgeon in Houston, Texas, who does uh, some of these. Um, so far, um, we found that in these patients, the, once again, these worst case patients where they have the scapular muscle detachments and they'll have very, very protracted, very, very abnormal position scapulas, uh, oh, about 10, 15% of them will have EMGs that show chronic denervation. And in that situation, it's all traction because of the position of the scapula. And we've, we've, fixed, the, uh, we've fixed the scapula, reattached the muscles, and you get an EMG in a year, and they find out that the denervation's gone away. So I have not so far um, done any explorations or releases for the long thoracic nerve. The, I, I'm pretty sure that the main culprits here are the low trap and the rhomboids. Serratus, probably uh, later on, but if you're talking about really bad dyskinesis, it's the low trap and the rhomboid that appear to be the, 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 the weakest muscles and the ones that create this most position right here. We work a lot on serratus strengthening because I think it gets weak because it's part of that force couple with the low trap. But so far, you know, there, there are patients in whom true serratus anterior palsy exists, and that's a, a separate group than the group we're talking about here. Regarding referral to surgery, uh, the situation in Belgium is that we always work on prescription of a doctor. So uh, when a patient comes to me, I'm supposed to treat him. I cannot uh, just refer him anywhere else. So if someone is sent to me by a general physician, I send him back. It's up to the doctor to decide. Now, how much time do I give myself? It depends on the problem. If I have a, a chronic shoulder pain without too much uh, structural damage, I give myself six weeks. And they have to be better in six weeks, much better, so an athlete. If not, I will think about the efficiency of my treatment. But of course, if you have, for instance, an MDI patient, uh, we call them the bendy wendies, they have to try much longer before they have to go to surgery. And even coming from a surgeon, they always say, you have to do physiotherapy for one year before even considering surgery. So it really depends on the problem. One of the problems I struggle with are the slap lesions, or maybe the ones that I think have a slap lesion, or that are diagnosed with a slap lesion, because then I also give myself six weeks. And if I'm not getting them to serve again after six weeks, even with the slap lesion, I think maybe it's the structure that is avoiding optimal performance. But very often, with a, a small slap lesion, they can perform better, but not optimal. So it, it really depends upon the problem when I, when I refer them. Fortunately, I have good communication with my surgeons, so I know perfectly how, how much time they give me and how <laughs> when I have to <laughs> return them to the... Uh, we've done two studies on this question. One is in a group of patients with this impingement, whatever. Um, and Tim Uhl, who does most of our outcomes work, has found if you look at outcome scores, self-reported assessment scores, that at about 10 visits over five to six weeks, so about once or twice a week, you will see a di divergence of the scores. So the ones that are going to get better will get better by six weeks. Uh, or trend toward better than ones or not. So, um, and that goes along with what we know about physiology. Physiological changes occur maximally about six weeks. We did a, a study, it's coming out in arthroscopy here soon, where we looked at a clinical prediction rule for who would get better with slap tears. We found, once again, at six weeks, um, we have them come back six weeks, and at that point in time, the ones are getting better and didn't need surgery, which was half of the group. Um, were getting better and the rest didn't. And when, when that split like that, we followed up a year later and we found out that 26 of the 30 who did not do well had had surgery at uh, by six weeks, didn't do well, had surgery. And of the 28 that did, were doing well, only one of the two of them had surgery. So it's, it's a pretty good split and well-defined split at about six weeks. 
So for throwing athletes with a scapula or problem that we send for rehab program, when do we make the decision? This is a success, it's a failure. We have to think about something else. Um, six weeks? Six, six, six weeks is what we give them, six to eight weeks. If they have only GERD, if that's the main problem, I expect uh, a better result much sooner. Very often I have, when you learn them to stretch and you stretch them intensively and you do mobilizations and you, you do stretching of the pec minor, normally they have less symptoms in three weeks. But of course, symptoms, then they have to have symptoms during daily life too. After six weeks, I think they're not finished with rehab. They have to continue. But if I didn't progress well enough, when after six weeks they're still here, we're not doing good. After six weeks, they have to be there, at least in rehab, and then we have to move on. For I always say my patients, you have to at least come to see me three months, not even once a week, but I always try to have nine sessions because that's what we get from the start in three months, and then they have to do their home program, so the rehab takes much longer. But the cutoff point of saying this is working or not for me is six weeks. Philip? To, to follow the same question, and uh, but to talk more uh, um, on the uh, so-called subacromial uh, impingement. So I have been uh, educated, and I think we can all, all of us, we can say that we have been educated in the world of acromioplasty. And uh, I see with the experience, we do less and less acromioplasty. And I always say that uh, we can see the experience of uh, shoulder surgeon based on the number of acromioplasty. I'm talking about uh, non-ruptured, uh, okay. I don't want to uh, enter in the debate of acromioplasty or not with uh, associated with a rotative curve repair. I'm talking about the subacromial. So probably uh, the more you do uh, acro simple acromioplasty, the less you have experimented in the shoulder surgery. But it's only based on my experience not on the concept like you have. So you have a concept, you have an experience. So based on what you observe with this scapula, what do you think about this uh, acromioplasty? I mean, uh, if I understand, if I follow your uh, presentation, there is no more indication for an acromioplasty on the uh, intact cuff, I would say non-rupture cuff, because oh. it's always a problem of scapula. No, it's not always. Um, if, if once again, this British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, consensus conference um, goes into this in some detail, uh, the, the involvement of the scapula observed scapular alterations and impingement is very, very high, almost 100%. Um, however, there are times when you have enough of the bone spur or enough damage that you do have to uh, go in there and do some. Uh, evaluation. However, um, if you if you do this test where you have this you know the painful arc, however you want to do it, whether it's the near or the or the Hawkins or whatever, and and you can take the scapula and you can assist it into this other position, and you have change in the symptoms. So they can raise their arm higher, they have less pain. Then that shows you very definitely that this position of the scapula is causing some of the problems, and that that group gets uh, the. Uh, uh, Gets the benefit, gets the big, big uh, uh, treatment with all the rehabilitation, with all the things that can go wrong. Anywhere from pec minor to scalenes to low trap to lat. I mean, you just name all these muscles need to be worked on. Internal rotation deficit, you have to get all those things. Uh, I looked, um, in, uh, this, uh, I wrote a paper in uh, instructional course lectures at the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons three years ago. And there are nine different reasons to get a painful arc. Um, biceps tendinopathy, rotator cuff tear, adhesive capsulitis, you know, cervical things. Scapula dyskinesis is very, very high. So if you rule all those out so that you have truly primary subacromial pathology, then there is a reason to do those. Now, I do about 650 operations a year, and, I'll, and, and last year I did one subacromial decompression. <laughs> You know, and, and I think you're exactly right. The more you realize that you're not getting very good results with this, and the literature will support the fact that, that the results of subacromial decompression for impingement are not very good and that therapy can match those usually. So I think your, your, your statement, your observation has been true in my experience as well. But you say, what are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to do these things that Ann showed on her algorithm because they do work. Now, did they change the scapula position? You know, Strife says it doesn't, okay? But are the symptoms better? Doggone, yes. 
Well, uh, it's not up to me. <laughs> it's that's what I want to say. It's not up to me to decide whether they go to surgery or not. But I do believe that um, the the impingement problem, whatever you want to call it, is much more of a functional problem than a structural problem. And it's not only the scapula. I'm, I might be a scapular researcher, but I'm not only a scapular clinician. So we look at the whole picture. And in my experience, but now it's really the clinician speaking, not the researcher. It's always the non-fitting of the glenohumeral joint. It's either too much upwards, too much forwards, and I always always say when I give a course I'm going to say t tell you now what you have to remember at the end get that humeral head back I mean in the throwing related pain because it's too much anteriorly so you have to position the scapula better but also train the posterior cuff to uh, treat the GERD problem so that you have better congruency in the joint and we had an interesting discussion at the last meeting where somehow we said maybe supracromial impingement doesn't exist, maybe it's all internal. And I, I always state that in the course and they say, what? Supracromial doesn't exist? It's, only, it's always somewhere a conflict bit within the joint. And if it's functional, I think we can treat it. Yeah, it is interesting that uh, Paula Ludwig from Minnesota actually got 12 patients, 12 subjects to volunteer to have pins stuck in their chromium, humerus, and and everywhere, and they found that at the position where you have the painful arc, that's not where the, the uh, greater tuberosity is in closest approximation to the acromion. That's right here. The greater tuberosity is in the closest approximation to the acromion right here. When you're up here, it's the, it's the internal impingement. It's the undersurface of the rotator cuff against the glenoid that creates the, the symptoms right here. So, I mean, it's not anatomically I mean, the, the idea that you're pinching the rotator cuff under the acromion or CA uh, arch right here is not anatomically true. That's down here. Okay. Uh, could I do a small comment? When I was a young surgeon, in Europe we talked lots of in, in the early 80s about uh, scapula rhythm. And we are talking about scapula who is da dancing around a shoulder. But uh, after that, we was too much busy to operate the shoulder, and we forgot about uh, the scapula. And what's happened is usually in the surgery, when we start to analyze on long term our results, we find that there is a problem. And for that reason, especially now in the sports medicine, uh, scapula dyskinesia become a uh, hot topic that people are uh, talking about it and uh, uh, we are coming back and hopefully we are going to do less surgery. And six weeks, uh, as you mentioned, you know, when you have, that's because I lived in Belgium, that's by our security social, six weeks we can give the patient the chance. You have to give him a little bit longer chance before deciding a surgery, you understand, because that's not going so quickly, you mm -hmm. understand. The six weeks, I mean, is for my failure or success. Whatever happens after that, if the surgeons say, I'm not going to do any surgery, just move on with your therapy, I will. But I'm, I'm a little, I want to have very quick results. The patient wants to be cured yesterday. So six weeks for him is a very long time. <laughs> okay, thank you for your comment. And shall we move on to uh, Matteo's presentation? Any questions to uh, pick major rupture? Yes. Hello, is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for your talk, Matteo. And I just wanted to ask you, do you think like the pec major rupture, is it like the Achilles where there's been some kind of tendinopathy that's usually asymptomatic before the rupture when you see the tissue when you operate them or do you think it's healthy tissue that's just been exposed to a, a crazy 160 kilogram bench press load before they rupture? I think it's both of, uh, of the problems. Because usually they, <coughs> they, lo they do a lot of training, so it's uh, repetitive. And uh, the accident itself, no, probably not, but uh, it's difficult to say. Usually you, have, uh, you can have pain before, but it's, it's rare. Huh? I, we don't do so many, so I think it's, uh, it's difficult to tell. But uh, I don't have, uh, I don't know if somebody here as uh, if they did studies about uh, tissue when we do surgery, or I don't if think they had so. It's more preceding, like if yes. they were complaining of yes. pain before or not. But so. usually not. Okay. No. 
Thank yes. you. Thank you, Matteo, also. Um, I believe there is, there is a strong belief amongst clinicians, especially in sports, you show the results that, that you call it recreational sports, and it's all about powerlifting and bodybuilding. Did you find something in the literature about the use of anabolics in these conditions? There is, there is an association, but it's not proof. There are no studies, uh, like prospective studies. You, you can just uh, do ret retrospective and see how many patients were using it. And, you know, it's not all the patient tells you what they are taking, so. Uh. You, you, do you and usually so ask your patients? Yes, I ask here. Usually they admit uh, yeah. easily. So the, in, in these cases, no, but usually they come and tell you, I take this and this. And any other questions? You know, listening to your lecture, uh, I uh, understand that, you know, bench press is such a kind of a dangerous exercise. Should we give any warning to the uh, athletes? You know, this is not a good, good exercise. Or should we uh, provide them to set some upper limit of the weight or something like that? I think for them, the, the, the purpose of this is to get big pegs. So yeah, I, I don't think uh, we cannot we stop them. Well, first of all, it's a very good exercise. I mean, if you want to build muscle mass, then it mm -hmm. does. The problem is that they can see it, and they know the girls can see it. Okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> so that's, that's, that's they do it uh, for that reason a lot. But okay. as as an uh, as an exercise to build power, for example, all of our American football players. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want power, then you do a bench press. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's all. So it's a very effective exercise. So mm -hmm. you cannot stop it. Okay. Yeah, is there say, any way? Say maybe uh, you shouldn't do as many. I don't know, but but it's it's too good an exercise. They is is there any way we can prevent this you know rupture? Well, I was going to add. I always say to my patients, it's fine to do the bench press because you cannot convince them to not do it. But please mm -hmm. start to train the muscles that you don't see in the mirror. Okay. And that's the, the back, of course, and also the inner muscles. I mean, they don't want to do cuff training, and it's necessary to keep the balance. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah. um, for every uh, rep of press, you got to do two rows. Okay. Guillermo, you have some question? Yes. My question was, uh, in any case of pectoralis major rupture uh, for reconstruction, is it advisable to do a bicep tenodesis as we perform with the subscapularis, as you can fix the pec? without touching the biceps that is quite near and perhaps it's going to be involved in the uh, scarring uh, tissue post-operative? It's a good question. I never did it. I, I don't have an answer for this. But uh, probably if the patient is symptomatic, you can, you, you can think about it, but difficult to... Okay. And you, you have to be careful not to, not to touch it when you, when you refix it. Okay, shall we go to Guillermo's presentation about suprascapular nerve release, neuropathy, any questions? Yep. Yes. Thanks again. Um, I'm very interested in this uh, uh, suprascapular nerve, um, um, what I call it, because I've worked for many years with volleyball players, and I've seen the, the complete range, and uh, so I was not very surprised that there is no consensus among surgeons, but is that, does that mean there is no consensus um, in the end, so I mean, let's say for the chronic cases, or do you have some consensus for the acute ones? Uh, in vulnerable players, is a, a kind of common finding that the atrophy of the infraspinatus due to the overuse of the shoulder uh, without the floor, as uh, Ben says, that the, the kinetic change uh, have no base. Uh, there are some patients that with only with rehab and time they full recover the, the infraspinatus. Uh, there is a syndrome the, that is uh, like the adhesive capsulitis that is uh, have a beginning and, and a, an end and the nerve recovers. And uh, when the, the nerve is, doesn't look that it's going to recover with the AMG, we proceed to, uh, and uh, when the patient is not doing good with the rehab of the posterior capsule as stretching and things like that, we give the patient a cortisone shot with a guided with the ultrasound. And if it doesn't work, we proceed to capsular release, a posterior capsular release. But we do not do the uh, decompression of the nerve at the spinoglenoid notch because in our hands, through the arthroscopy, is too risky. Even though Plancher and, and Proventer uh, recommend the technique, as the, the, the anatomy is quite... Um, 
particular and quite different in each patient and the other. We, we have a, a, a big experience with decompression of the nerve at the suprascapular notch, but the spinal glenoid notch is, is more demanding. Uh, I agree that you know, the infraspinatus is a very interesting muscle. You can, you can do a lot of things around the shoulder without the infraspinatus muscle. Um, tennis players, volleyball players will have atrophy and they'll still be able to hit. I, I don't have a lot of experience with them, but I do have a lot of experience with tennis players and baseball players. And, um, and there are a couple of top 100 tennis players who have, have atrophy of the infraspinatus. And what they use is, the, actually, when you're out here, the muscle that really is decelerating is the teres, not the infraspinatus. And if you look at the EMG activation, the infraspinatus doesn't turn on uh, till later in the game. It's, it's not that, and you don't need it to external rotate till you get that with your body rotation. And, and posterior deltoid. And it, there's been at least one, what we call a perfect game in uh, Major League Baseball. You know, no, no hits, no runs, no everything. And several no hitters pitched by pitchers who have no infraspinatus. So you can get by without infraspinatus. So that doesn't bother me nearly as much as the suprascapular um, uh, notch uh, and the supraspinatus bother me. Uh, but I still don't have my handle. Uh, around the, the suprascapular notch either. So I don't worry nearly as much about the infraspinatus around the spinal glenoid notch. Now I do decompress all the cysts and all that stuff right there, and they do get better uh, if, you, if you fix the labrum and decompress the cyst. Those will get better. Any other questions? You know, Guillermo, in case with a massive tear, some doctors say, you know, the atrophy and the fatty degeneration may be related to the suprascapular nerve neuropathy. But in case with massive tears, we also see the same muscle change in the subscapularis as well, which has nothing to do with the suprascapular nerve. So I don't know how much that uh, neuropathy will, be, will contribute to the atrophy and fatty infiltration. Uh, the, the, the surgery uh, uh, release the nerve is like the, the bicep tenodesis when it is, uh, there is a multifactorial origin of the pain. Uh, you can fix the calf and then release the nerve. Uh, we launched a study uh, in, in massive calf tears, uh, uh, randomized. Uh, some patients got the nerve release and the other patient uh, didn't. Uh, but the, the, the results are quite difficult because it's the same case as bicep tenodesis that you really don't know if the postoperative pain coming from your uh, calf reconstruction or the bicep tenodesis or the bicep tenotomy. It's quite difficult to the assessment of the postoperative assessment, what, what uh, the steps of surgery are uh, uh, the key for the patient. So uh, I, in our hands, we, we are not sure which patient really needs the nerve decompression in a massive calf tear scenario. And our group that you you and Ben are, are part of the group, uh, even long discussions, uh, we uh, lacking uh, of uh, evidence-based data. Uh, we really did, it. right now we don't have any statement to recommend the, the release or not of the suprascapular nerve in massive uh, rotator calf reconstructions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we enjoyed the fruitful discussion. Thank you.